here with Representative Jason Zachary of Knox County, uh, state representative. Sir, you recently got the boot from YouTube, though you were reinstated. The video was reinstated, right? Uh, but sure. you, yes, you've, you've now fallen into a, a class that I also belong to. I'm not really sure what we should call ourselves, but... <laughs> The, the the rebels who then eventually get let back in for whatever reason when YouTube decides they don't want they don't want the fight. I'm not quite sure how they make their decisions to let us out of jail. But can you tell everybody what happened to you? Because it's really fascinating. Sure, it, it is, Allison. Thank you for having me on. So I was presenting a bill as a state representative. I'm at the actually at the Capitol in a committee hearing presenting a bill and it's our COVID protection bill that actually the governor's going to sign today. It's the most sweeping protection bill in the country. Tennessee's kind of leading the way in that. Uh, but I presented that bill. And so what I usually don't uh, put type out an opening statement, I usually just get up, present the bill and don't provide a ton of context. But this particular bill, it was so important and it was going to draw so much attention. I wanted to have a statement actually that I could go through, read through to make sure I was clear in my presentation. That's what I did. And so that that uh, that presentation was roughly eight minutes. And in that presentation, I referenced uh, a quote from Ronald Reagan from C.S. Lewis. I provide statistics <laughs> directly. And I've actually got in case we start talking about I've actually got my bill book here with all the statistics that I printed off from the CDC. I have got uh, peer reviewed studies, uh, the, the whole list. And so I went through and kind of gave some statistics. I walked through the facts about that where some well, some would say we're still 19 months into 15 days to flatten the curve. It just kind of talked through that. And so I don't know if it was the Ronald Reagan quote, the C.S. Lewis quote, uh, the multiple references to the Constitution and the First Amendment, or just the facts that I quoted uh, via the CDC that got me banned. But again, that's in a committee. We vote for the bill. The bill passes out of committee. And it was up for maybe, I think it was up for the full day. And then I started getting some emails and texts from people saying, man, you're not going to believe this, but you've been banned from YouTube. And so at first, I was so, at first I was so busy that I didn't really put it together. And I was like, well, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't even have a, you, I don't think I have a YouTube channel, but the caucus, our Republican caucus actually posted the video. And I don't think I realized that because I was like, well, they can't ban it off streaming off our site, but the Republican caucus had put it up and that it had been taken down. And so it was kind of funny as I was walking to the Capitol, we have a tunnel we go through from our building to the Capitol. As I was walking through, I was literally getting like high fives from senators and other reps like, hey, congratulations on being banned. And <laughs> yeah, and so it was just kind of funny. And then I guess the next day or two, uh, they actually put it back up. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the proud, the few in the proud of the, of the band. Okay, so I'm, I'm actually, I think this is, this is the video. Is this right? Is this you? That that is absolutely me. I, I think I think this might have been it. It's uh, opening remarks. COVID. That's it. Is that yes. you? Yeah. That's, is it, I yeah. think this is it. That's it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's okay. Hard to, yeah. Um. So so just so everybody is aware, this is you actually doing your job right on the the floor of uh, the Capitol. Right, or, this, you know, or the house. This, this, yeah, this, this is actually in a committee hearing oh, room. Committee. So our committee okay. rooms are in a building across the street, and so that that's in committee. And then after it passes through committee, final presentation is on the house floor in the Capitol. But yes, that's in committee, and you can see me actually looking down and reading it. So I'm not riffing. I mean, this is I actually prepared statement. I had a, a data analyst I work with send me all the statistics with the sources. So that way they're all in my bill book in case anybody asked. And so I'm literally reading a prepared statement. So again, it's not me just shooting off the uh, shooting off the cuff. It's me reading a prepared statement. And that's what YouTube banned. Well, and, and it's just the other thing, even if you weren't, even if you were just riffing, you're you're in the act of doing your job as a state representative. And what's been fascinating to me as a, a former broadcast journalist, now independent media type on YouTube, is that if if somebody like me tries to actually cover history, like I'm gonna cover your presentation, regardless of, of what it is that you say, I'm sorry, no offense to your profession or anything, but if we were to start just slicing politicians from social media for misinformation, I don't know how many of you guys would be left at all anyway. And so it's just interesting how we pick and choose, but yeah. say I, I cover it, 
I want to go, I want to cover your speech. I can't even do that now without worrying about getting struck as well. And, and it's really problematic because if you can't know what your government officials are saying, then how do you have an informed uh, voting populace? And so, so it's, it's, it's really, in my opinion, I mean, fascinating is a nice word for it, but I think uh, super problematic and, and potentially dangerous is is probably the best way to describe it because you can't be an informed voter if you can't hear what your your legislators are saying. And and this is you just doing your, this is not you at home cooking, you know, on Instagram right. talking about your ideas. This is you actually presenting uh, to, to this committee. So it's just crazy to me. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, we, we, as a, as a state representative, I mean, I'm part of the people's house Tennesseans. Again, this is a COVID protection bill that would, that impacts Tennesseans from Memphis to Mountain City, one side, one side of the state to the other. And they need to be able to hear the debate, hear the presentation, hear the debate and understand the bill because it impacts every Tennessean. And so that's what I'm elected to do. And so in some of the conversations we've had in some of the research our team did is that they don't know of another another circumstance where an actual elected official, elected representative in his official capacity presenting a bill and and discussing the merits of a bill was banned from YouTube for actually, I mean, again, this is not like you said, it wasn't like me at home or me giving a stump speech out on the campaign trail. It was literally me doing my job in the committee of the of, of our capital in, in our in our in our in the people's house and that's a, that's a big deal and so the tech oligarchs have are literally d determining and filtering what they feel like it's appropriate for people to hear mm -hmm. and unfortunately congress doesn't have the will to act and to take steps and i, I think it's at, is it section 230 that provides them the immunity there are certain things congress can do and i've talked to senator haggerty here in tennessee and congressman burchett and that's something they have the desire to do. But right now, unfortunately, the Democrats don't. Democrats are in control. And so it just continues to roll on as it is. But whether it's Facebook, whether it's YouTube, Twitter, whomever it is, uh, they literally are manipulating what goes on their platform for, for people to see. And there's no consequence to them because they have immunity provided to them by the federal government. OK, I want to talk about that real fast. But don't let me forget to ask you exactly what the bill is, because I don't even think we've touched on that, yeah, uh, right. which we should get into. Um, so my question for you about why these tech companies are doing this is what role do you think the government is playing in their decision making? Because you referenced how uh, Congress doesn't have the will to act, but they do have the will to pressure in the opposite direction. And it does seem like that when we hear uh, the president or the White House spokesperson or somebody high up uh, in government talking about misinformation and 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 you know just bringing the hammer down on people on social media. It's not too long after that that we start seeing the the news tighten on people. And so I, I'm just curious what you think the role of government is in what we're dealing with with censorship online. Yeah, and it, it, it is, it's a delicate balance to watch because, uh, to walk. And obviously me being a Republican, a very conservative Republican, I feel like government's role is to maintain a framework of ordered liberty. I mean, we literally have a framework we work in, but uh, to, to put a, a an importance on individual liberty, freedom, unalienable rights, separation of powers, the principles of our founding is literally what I took an oath to do. And so you walk a very fine line but as I've told people before, there's certain things we vote on and steps we take based on what previous legislatures did before I ever got here. And so that's that's very similar to what Congress is dealing with when it comes to these these tech companies. And again, I believe it's 230 that provides them the absolute immunity where they can basically do whatever they want to. And there are no consequences for them. They can pull off accurate information. They can censor Dr. Robert Malone, who's the uh, the invent inventor of the mRNA vaccine, and they can take that information and they can decipher it and filter it in whatever way they see fit. And in my opinion, in certain cases, spread misinformation by the way they edit, delete, and control. And in doing that, they're com they have complete immunity. And if that were not the case, if they did not have that blanket immunity, they would have to conduct themselves differently. So Congress put that in place under section, again, I think it's 230, 
under Section 230. And all Congress would have to do is take the step to remove some of that protection. It will completely change the way they go about doing their business, just like I'm a business owner, just like me as a business owner, when government changes laws or provides COVID business immunity or whatever it is, it changes the way my business operates. It would be the same thing with these tech oligarchs. But part of the problem is the political will to be, we're, we're a nation of political will, the political will to be able to do that is not there and it hasn't been there and again republicans were in power republicans could 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 have taken that step when we were in power but we chose not to democrats are in, in uh, power now without thinking about the fact that the pendulum will probably swing in 2022 it may swing significantly in 2024 so if they were wise they would take those steps because when the republicans are in power it does soften some because republicans control uh, government and so it's just this pendulum that continues to swing and Congress, unlike many state legislatures, do not have the political will to act because they always want to get reelected. That's typically what they're, what they're there for. Before we get to the rest of this video, don't forget you can support my work by also checking out my sponsors and having a glass of wine or a cup of coffee in honor of free speech. The first is AllisonWinePromo.com. Allison with one L, WinePromo.com. You get 50% off of my favorite Argentinian Malbecs and 50% off of shipping. They have switched out the three bottles from the last pairing, so check them out. Many of these are high-altitude wines. They're very robust. They use no flavoring, no filtering, no dyes, and no excess chemicals. But if you need something to wake you up, like a strong cup of coffee, check out TwinEngineCoffee.com slash Allison, TwinEngineCoffee.com slash Allison. They've got a wide variety of roast. These are high altitude shade grown Nicaraguan coffees that are also USDA certified organic. They also do a lot of great work to help prevent sea turtle nests from being poached. You can support their work by also going to twinenginecoffee.com slash Allison and become a sponsor. And they'll even show you video of when the sea turtle nests that they're protecting are hatched. So check out my sponsors and support free speech wherever you are. So the counterpoint to the removed Section 230 argument is that it would make it harder for smaller platforms to allow for the speech that they have now become the refuges for uh, simply because it opens them up to litigation. And so the question would be, if you took Section 230 away, would they actually would you get what you don't want in that you'd have these bigger companies who have the the financial support and the ability to have massive legal teams and then would they even they clamp down on speech more because they're like well now we're responsible we can be sued for what we put out there and so we're going to be even more restrictive and then the smaller companies are like well we can't compete at all anymore because now we also just we just don't have the resources i've, I've heard people push back on the on the Section 230 uh, argument in that way. I know that I'm on other platforms like Rockfin, for instance, and I know they say specifically if Section 230 were just flat out removed, that they would have a very difficult time continuing. So so I don't know. I, I definitely think their their solution needs to be uh, 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 found, that there, this this problem needs to be addressed. I just, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, I, I hear, I can hear the other side too, and, and I would be concerned. Um, I'm sure you can appreciate this as somebody who uh, works on lawmaking, that sometimes you have good intent and then you get an unexpected outcome. And so it, it seems like an ecosystem that needs a delicate uh, change, but I'm not quite sure exactly what that is. Um, can you tell me about the bill itself before we sure. wrap up? Yeah, absolutely. So it is a sweeping COVID protection bill, um, does a few things. It bans any governmental entity from requiring uh, proof of vaccination. It bans any governmental entity from requiring a business to show, show proof of vaccination. It bans any governmental entity from requiring masks, state and local. Uh, it prohibits anyone from requiring proof of vaccination, period. So we took the step because the Biden administration has weaponized the free market against the people with the OSHA rule, with the CMS rule, with the federal contractor rule. We felt like we had to take a step to protect Tennesseans and protect their livelihood. And so we did that with this bill. It simply says that you can't require proof of vaccination. An employer can't say that an employer doesn't ask to see your flu vaccine, your polio vaccine proof, your rubella, whatever it may be. And but now we're doing this with COVID and we're simply we're saying that people can't work if they don't have a COVID vaccine. And so we've stopped that in Tennessee. That law actually is going to be signed today by the governor. He announced 
Um, so that'll go into effect today. Uh, we did a couple of different things with right to prescribe, allowing a doctor to freely prescribe and dispense medicine for COVID-19 at his discretion without fear of having his license, license revoked. Uh, we actually uh, added anti-commandeering language. This is a big deal. Uh, it's basically 10th Amendment through and through where we say that no, uh, no state resources, whether that's money, whether that's facilities, people, uh, cars can be used to facilitate a law, rule, or executive order from the federal government related to COVID-19 countermeasures. If they want to continue to take this and overstep the constitutional framework that they're supposed to operate in, then they're going to have to come to Tennessee and do it themselves. Uh, they're, a big deal is a right not to die alone. Uh, we put it. We put that in our legislation. As many people know around the country, that um, uh, because of COVID, many facilities. It doesn't happen much in Tennessee, but many facilities were not allowing their loved ones to be with those who were dying in the last days of COVID. And so we stopped that, making sure that every facility has to provide a loved one access to uh, to their loved one who is uh, passing away. Uh, we've got something called a mature minor doctrine in Tennessee, and so we ensured that uh, every parent has to sign off or give consent before their child is given the COVID-19 vaccine. No, no doctor can just give that to them without having the parent to, um, to uh, uh, sign off on that. And then uh, we address monoclonal antibodies. As everyone knows, the federal government inserted the states in a process that was actually working really well related to monoclonal antibody distribution. Uh, we simply said in that that it's at the doctor's discretion about whom gets that monoclonal antibody uh, treatment. There were some guidance that came out from the NIH that said you had to prioritize this group over that group. Again, taking the, the decision out of the doctor's hands. So we made sure that doctor had, the, had those decisions and then uh, finally, and I think I've hit all the high points, finally, um, we provide a cause of action. So if someone, you don't have to show proof of vaccination anymore in Tennessee, but if somebody, if somebody mandates the vaccine and you feel compelled to do it just because they're asking you to, and you have an adverse reaction from that uh, vaccination, then you have a cause of action against that employer because they force you to do it. So the intent of that is to hopefully the businesses won't even mandate the COVID-19 vaccine, because as the CDC director said on August 5th, it does not stop the transmission of the virus. I think we've got my Twitter account there. I think it was the Netherlands. Uh, the, uh, uh, the numbers were out today. 85% of that country is vaccinated and they're having a massive spike. Vermont, same thing, highest vaccinated state in our country, uh, having a massive spike. So the vaccine does not stop transmission. And so we've lost our minds and we've literally lost all common sense forcing this vaccine on people, not even taking into account natural immunity or certain reasons that they don't get the vaccine. It's a personal choice. We've never done this with the flu vaccine or anything else. Um, so that's, that's, those are the highlights of the bill. I maybe missed a thing or two, but that's basically the, uh, the framework and the nuts and bolts of it. And hopefully the governor, the governor is going to be signing that this afternoon and Tennesseans are much better off individual liberty and freedom are protected and preserved in a, in a much greater way, much greater way, related to COVID-19 in Tennessee with that bill passing. Last question, because I had thought about this and have had people bring this up to me. And so I'm glad I get the chance to ask somebody in your position. If someone says, hey, you set out to protect businesses from government overreach, but are you doing the same thing by saying, hey, if I'm a business and I want to do this, I, I'm not being forced to, I want to mandate it, that now the government's telling me I can't? How do you respond to that? We as government, I, I get that argument all the time. And even some of the businesses group, business groups here in Tennessee really push back. The chamber, obviously the chamber pushes back anytime you do anything related to business. But NF, NFIB and other groups who I work so well with. And again, I am a small business owner. The, the legislature, state legislatures are part time. I make twenty two thousand dollars a year to be a part time legislator. And so you have to have a full time job. I'm a small business owner and have been for years and years. So, I mean, I love small business. I love business owners. My dad's an entrepreneur. It's, I've never worked for anyone other than my dad or myself. So it's my life. I understand it completely. But I also know in running a business, government puts so many restrictions even here in tennessee there are so many things businesses have to do or are required to do mandated to do by government so sometimes when you take steps like what we just took you get the pushback that you just referenced from these business owners well government shouldn't be telling me to do this i can do this government needs to stay out of my business well 
Unfortunately, in 2021, government is involved in, in all business. Now, Tennessee is very different than California, New York, or Illinois, and that's why we're one of the top five states economically in every category, because we try to limit government, we limit regulation, and the burden we place on business. But again, as I, I think I said this earlier, the Biden administration has weaponized the free market against the people of this country. We've never had a situation where the government says, the federal government says, you put something in your body or you are not allowed to work. So the OSHA rule with those over 100, the CMS rule, people need to realize this CMS rule that there has been no state issued yet, this is going to have a significant impact on health care if this is allowed to go forward. The first shot has to be by December 5th, the second shot by January 4th. Our hospitals are already, already so understaffed. Every CEO I've talked to in hospitals says, that it's not a capacity issue, it's a staffing issue. They're also understaffed. You take this step, uh, for example, and you'll know this being here in Knoxville when you were here in the, uh, the 2000s, is that Covenant Health is our largest employer in Knox County. They manage most of the major hospitals. Roughly 30% of their staff is not vaccinated. Many of them have already had COVID. Many of them are young women, nurses, who don't want to take the shot because they have not had kids yet, and no one can tell them for sure that they won't have some sort of adverse effect or impact. Well, when this mandate goes into place by December 5th, many of those nurses are going to walk. That is going to create a significant, a, a significant impact on the quality of care these facilities can provide. And that's just not just in Knox County. That's, in a, that's across the nation. Again, we're, you literally have a rule that is, that is going to significantly cripple the healthcare system in many areas because you're going to have many of these doctors and many of these nurses leave for whatever reason because they don't want to get the vaccine. So that is the danger in these mandates. And so back to your original question, when the federal government, the federal government, the Constitution tells the federal government what it can do, enumerated powers, it puts a strict box around them. The constitutions of our states basically have to limit what states can do because James Madison wrote in Federalist 45, the powers provided by the Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. The powers provided by the Constitution to the states are numerous and indefinite. States, man, states can rock and roll and there's so many things we can do, but the federal government can't do that. And there's strict, there's strict boundaries within the executive branch in Article 2. Now, if, Allison, if Congress had have passed a law all legislative power rests with Congress as it opened up in Article 1. If Congress had a passed a law related to OSHA or whatever, man, this is a completely different conversation. But again, this is an executive order that did not go through Congress where the president is weaponizing OSHA in the free market against the people. And when that happens, specifically, and I'm being really partisan here, but the specifically, the red states are the firewall between the people and the federal government. We as Tennessee, this Tennessee state government had to act on behalf of the people to protect Tennesseans across the board. And again, are there people that are not going to like it? Absolutely. I mean, there's decisions we make every time we pass a bill that some aspect of the people don't like it. Tennessee's a 65, 35 state, 65% Republican, 35% Democrat. So many of the decisions we make, 35% of the people really don't like it. And that's, that's part of it. I mean, that's just simply part of our job and our role as elected officials. But Tennesseans are better off. And again, individual liberty, freedom are much more protected with this bill in place than they were without it. Okay, please give my best to my buddies at WBIR. They will always have a special place. Uh, <laughs> no matter how much uh, smack I talk about mainstream media, I do miss my friends at WBIR. So tell them I said hi. Everybody go follow uh, Representative Zachary is representative, or no, at Jason Zachary TN on Twitter. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Allison. Good to be with you. Thank you.